Well, Lord, we thank you for what's been happening today. We thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit presence, alive and fresh and new. And we thank you, Lord, for the people we got to recognize and, and, and the giftings you've given everybody, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity to praise and worship you. And right now, Father God, we're coming to you as people's hearts are malleable now. They've, they've got fertile ground, Lord. So we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to share your word Father God, that will speak from your word, that the book called the Bible. It's given us instructions, and we thank you, Lord, that it will be planted and it will take deep root in our hearts, Lord. We thank you for this opportunity and come to you in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So today, I titled this Transformation. And it was something that I'd been, like, really dealing with myself. And, you know, I've I've learned a lot about spiritual things over the last couple of decades, but there's still a lot more to learn. And so I just said, I got it before I can talk to anybody, I need to look at myself and kind of really ask the tough questions of why certain things still manifest. Okay? Um, like, I'm talking about things like really practical things like my mood, emotions. Um, why does that continue to fluctuate? And so I, it, it's kind of clear to me that. God designed our emotional network to be the byproduct of whatever our mind is focusing on. I mean, so it, it, we're going to talk about this today. In other words, what we say about ourselves has a direct impact on how our body will respond. For instance, if we say stuff like, why does this always happen to me? And then we've probably got our bodies like, I'll guarantee you, your body's going to be disempowered. You're, you're probably going to have a frown on your face if that's what we're kind of speaking. Um, so when we can understand that, like if we really grasp that our emotional state, is, it's critical to understand in determining how we actually operate from moment to moment. It's, and when you figure this out, here's the deal, it's like you just struck oil, and it just keeps spurting out, and it's like going to transform your life. Okay? Now, the, now, there's a couple of areas that are very important and critical to understanding this. One is personal, dealing how you how you figure this out yourself, and the other is interpersonal and how you interact with other people. Okay? And so, for instance, when we interact with other people, we really need to learn how to relate to other people's feelings, other people's uh, how they process things. It's the term for this is empathy. And we need to kind of, you know, look through their lens um, on how to relate to what they're going through. Which also means during that interaction, if you do this with people, you're going to gain trust and you'll learn how to, what's called the rapport you have with them and things will continue to, ma to grow better and you'll, you'll start to understand interactingly how they operate and you'll, you'll kind of figure that out, okay? Um, but all of that will not matter if you, because it won't have the, as good of a, or the better effect or the best effect unless you figure out how you operate. You've got to figure out your own personal mastery, and you've got to master yourself. And what this really boils down to is will we be objective about ourselves? Will we have self-awareness about us? And then once we're honest about ourselves, we need to go to the next step and change our state or adjust ourselves based on what we just figured out about ourselves, okay? So in other words, it really boils down to this. You've got to take 100% responsibility for your actions. You can't blame them on somebody else. You can't blame them on a circumstance. What I find out about myself, I tend to still do that. So I'm just saying, this is what you got to do. You got to take 100% for you, all right, and how you react. And I can say all that because I know most of you in here. You've said you've received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So guess what that further implies? We're to, we're to be different than the world. Okay? We are from another world now. We're aliens here, but we're here, so we're not supposed to just plan to escape. Since we're here today, there's something for us to do. There's this assignment. And one of the easiest ways to understand what the assignment is, is to use this to reflect what's on the inside. Okay? Because here's the deal, as Christians, you, and you may not know this, but I'm hoping you're going to understand today and get this, this, un, this teaching, is we believe, you've heard some songs already that say, we, have, we believe we have the power of the living God resi residing within us. Okay? 
You, I mean, I think you agree with that, if, if you know that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, okay? So Jesus said, you know, while he's ministering, that folks, all the time he'd say, the kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God is here. And then he'd have these parables and these teachings and these interaction where he'd talk about the kingdom of God and that's not the kingdom of God and this is the kingdom of God. And so, you've heard this from me before. What, well, what is the kingdom of God? I want to sing it. Oh, the kingdom of God is not meat nor drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy. Go ahead and put Romans, Romans up there. Put the scripture, 14, 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat nor drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy. The kingdom of God is not meat nor drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy. Joy, peace, and righteousness in the Holy Ghost. Joy, peace, and righteousness in the Holy Ghost. Right? Okay? Now, now, okay, so if that's, that's the kingdom of God and it's in the Holy Ghost, where does the Holy Ghost reside? No, you're not. No, you're not. You are the temple. No, you're not. No, you're not. You are the temple. No, you're not. No, you're not. You are the temple. Ye are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Uh, just, just singing scriptures here, right? So if the Holy Ghost is in us and the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost, where does righteousness, peace, and joy reside? Is it at Starbucks? Is it on TV? Is it in alcohol and drugs? Is it at the mall? Resides in us, if we're Christians, okay? So that further implies then that our assignment as Christians is to be demonstrating on earth the very presence of the living God, righteousness, peace, and joy. Now, I get so I see some of you, you're smiling, because you've heard this, parts of this already, okay? And see, we demonstrate that by not being affected by what's going on out there. Because what we have in here is established on a better promise, okay? Which is the kingdom of God. These is unshakable things are on the inside. And here's the deal. God will use events that are going to happen out there. Actually, he'll use events that happen in here <laughs> because you're going to interact with people. Okay? And he'll use these events in our lives to shape us into vessels that can carry and model the reality of what we claim we have on the inside. Now, I want to make this practical today. In other words, we've got something we've got to do. Scripture tells us then, what do we got to do? We have to submit our bodies and to renew our minds. Romans chapter 12, right? Put up Romans 12, starting with verse 1. Paul was talking to the, to the church in Rome, and he goes, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Now remember, the Jews would offer all the animal sacrifices. They'd cut them into pieces and put them on the altar. What now we're supposed to do, we're not supposed to cut ourselves up, but you offer your entire body on the altar, okay? And so the next verse says, do not conform, because you might be going, what? Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. Turn into, from that little caterpillar into a beautiful butter, butterfly, right? To, do not follow the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind then you will be able to test and approve what God's good, pleasing, and perfect will is. Okay? So you give your body. These are the things we got to do. We give up our body, and we renew our mind. The moment we become born again, every single part of us, folks, is to become spiritually sanctified and submitted for the Master's use. Everything about us. That's why we lay it on the altar. Your will be done. What do you want of me, Lord? Okay? That's why Paul now says, later on, in the, he's writing to the church in Thessal Thessal the Thessalonian church in Greece, okay? And he says, I want you to submit your entire 
spirit, soul, and body. Not part. Your entire spirit, soul, and body to be sanctified. In other words, one of the developments then that happens when we receive Jesus Christ. I mean, it's this, you know, you believe by faith. It's, it, he gives us it, by grace through faith. So we receive this free gift and you believe it by faith. You don't see it and it happens in here. The Holy Spirit resides in here, the Word of God says. Okay? And we're, it was dead. And now it's anew. It's born again. It's, in the Greek, it's the pneuma. And it's born again. It's new. And so we are set apart now for supernatural, sacred, anointed purposes according to God's will. Well, here's the deal. That ain't going to happen if we're freaking out emotionally at every turn. You're not going to be showing what you have on the inside, yet you've got a sticker on your car saying, Welcome to this church. I'm a part of this church. And then we're driving around like wild people. Hello. Good morning. See, this is stuff that Candace and I have shared the moment you guys have walked in this door, however long you've been here. We constantly talk about this. We have to work on our souls, and we have to take ownership of our souls. We have to take ownership of our bodies. And frankly, many of us do not treat our souls like it's part of the supernatural formula. But we're supposed to. Many of us don't treat our bodies like they're part of the supernatural formula, but they are. See, spirit, soul, and body. See, many Christians tend to perceive people as being spiritual if they're acting weird, and, they're, and then they're in the natural if they're normal. But what I've witnessed in over 15 years of being a pastor is that there are people who are acting, acting weird, thinking they're spiritual, and peeping acting natural that are actually more anointed. Good morning. And this really comes down to is whether our spirit, soul, and body are in harmonious, mature, developing, functioning under one holy anointing. See, our body is sanctified holy weapon in the warfare against the enemy. And I don't think a lot of people realize this. In other words, the Spirit of God cannot be communicated unless our body is on the same page as the born-again spirit man on the inside. I've, I've referred to this multiple times when you hear me say, this is the term I use. You are showing an incongruent testimony if you're acting different than what's on the inside of you. Okay? Paul, Paul talks about this in the Corinthians, to the Corinthian church. It's in the second letter. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2. He says, you are an epistle written into our hearts, known and read by all men. In other words, folks, when people look at us, they ought to be able to do a scan and get an impression of what God looks like. Right? Let that sink in. Like when they just look at you, you should go, I want what you got. Why? Because you're congruently showing me something that happened to you on the inside. I know believers. Now, please don't take offense to this. But I know believers that have let their physical bodies go to pot and think the, uh, the, the, the anointing is going to pick up the tap. It's terrible, stinking thinking. And it's all over Christianity. That's an incongruent testimony. You know, you know, and I've heard pastors say that. You know, physical man's not that important. I'm spiritual. I'm in the Word. Well, folks, God has so marvelously like made the body that he's wired it so that neurologically... What we do with our body has a direct relay message to our brain that ties into our emotional state. In other words, that just comes to this. Our bodies do not lie. Our bodies will show what's really going on. Okay? The body is so wired to the soul and spirit that what we do physically connects to the neurological system that supports or contradicts what our purpose is in the moment. And what I mean is if you want your spirit, soul, and body to be on the same page, you have got to take ownership of what you do with your body. I'm, this is real practical. And that actually means the stuff, the things you stuff into your mouth. The, the, okay? And now, the other thing is how do you take care of this thing? This is really practical. And it has a direct impact. And like breaking this down even further would imply that when I smile... There's a message that's going to the, my brain that says something's up. And when I frown, there's a message that's going to my brain that's saying something's down. 
okay? I mean, just think about it. when people aren't doing too well. They're not doing too well. They slouch. They're droopy, right? And on the flip side like of that, when people are doing, they stand up straight, put their shoulders back, stick their chest out, stand up tall, confident. People go, man, that guy's got it going on. See, I'm discussing this today because I believe this has been way, way too trivial, trivialized and not looked at with seriousness in our Christian journey of transformation. Just think about this. Why are certain people, why are we attracted to certain people? Situations. It's because people have a physiology, and physiology is just a fancy word for body, okay? They have a physiology that's mastering their own body and mastering their own emotions, and that will attract other people to that. And why? Because strength and confidence is being just exuded from that. Okay, so, so bringing this alongside, what a, what a Christian is supposed to be then would mean that when we say we're a Christian, we actually need to look like what a Christian is supposed to be looking like. Because if we don't look what we've told the world we are and what we believe in, then here's the deal. Our house is going to crumble. Our house is going to fall because it's incongruent. We're not, we're not doing it. So guess what? Your house will fall. And see, this is supposed to apply to everything and everywhere we go. And in other words, 100% of the time. And you have the greatest impact on whether that does it or not because you've got to do a good self-assessment and keep that rolling 24-7. That you can change it, just like that. You know how fast you can change it? Snap your fingers, heartbeat, whatever you want to call it. Blink your eye. That's how fast you can change it. you just got to renew your mind to this. you just got to take control of it. You've got to take ownership of it. See, this means our body has to be in agreement with what our spirit is saying. And our spirit is fine. Our spirit is smiling. Our spirit is great. Our spirit is full. Now our soul, our mind, will, and emotions, and our body got to get on board with the spirit. Okay? And here's the deal. Since our spirit says we're overcomers, then we got to be overcomers too. I, I don't know. I, I don't know. Maybe it's really sinking in. I don't know if you're smelling what I'm cooking yet. I don't even know if you're chewing what I'm tasting. But I'm telling you, I hope this is getting in there. See, because really, folks, it's more than just walking around saying, I'm an, over, I'm an overcomer. I'm an overcomer. you got to look like you're an overcomer because I don't want you laying hands on me if you're this. I'm an overcomer. Okay, good. Now you're getting it. Right? I mean, it makes no sense to walk around saying that as well as telling everybody on social media how great you are as a Christian. Right? If your physiology when people see you is not congruent with that very claim. Now, and I know somebody's probably right now going, I'm wondering if this is really spiritual. I got news for you. We are to put on Christ by faith and praise God and celebrate when we don't feel like it. Okay? All right. Because it doesn't matter what we feel like. Our physiology is going to determine where we're going. It's going to determine where we're going. Right? And I'm just sharing practically of what true transformation looks like. Don't look at this as some kind of like just unattainable spiritual thing. This is spiritual, but it's spirit, soul, and body to understand true transformation of what we, all right, come on, we sang the, the scriptures. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost is in here. So if you're looking for righteousness, peace, and joy, you better look what Jesus did for you because it's inside of you. Okay? It's just your mind, will, and emotions, and your body are suppressing it. Once in a while, it might make a showing, usually on a Sunday at church. Now, I'm going to point the finger at me. i got some personal experience that I want to share. Many of you know I was in the Navy for 22 years. I didn't, you know, getting ready for this. And a couple of weeks ago I talked about, I shared a story about that pastor in the trapeze. And it made me think, wait, I've done so much in the Navy and so many things that I did crazy stuff. I had, and I immediately was reminded of this event that happened while I was in aviation officer candidate school. If you ever saw the movie Officer and a Gentleman, that's the program I went through and started in November 1st, 1986. So in January 1987, 
I got introduced to this thing that I had no idea was coming around the corner. It's called the helicopter dunker, the helo dunker. Now, uh, Una, can you show, just show a picture there. I went to this morning and found, like, okay, you'll see, I'm going to talk about this. This is this thing filling up with water. Show the other slide, one, two, please, now. Just so you kind of get, that's kind of, so I want to describe this. Okay, you can put the title back up. So the helo dunker, as it's called, and those are new ones. Like the one I had, picture a soda can turned on its side, cut the, uh, cut the sides up, put a little place where you'd see a door, make a couple of windows. You'd have a pilot and a co-pilot up front with a makeshift wall, a little hole for a door to go through. There's no swinging doors, just an opening, just so you get a visual. So you got seats there, and then in the back, uh, you'd had three, three or four seats on each side, okay? So we go, now, I started with 88 men and women in my class, November 1st of 1986. When I got commissioned, raised my right hand, February 27th, 1987, only 27 of us remained. One of the things that these kind of programs do is they weed out those who quit. They call it, I want your drop on request. I want your DOR. They don't force you. They're just going to push you to beyond what you can do, and they want you to, to quit because they don't want you in there doing stress-filled things down the road. So we had done other stuff in the pool. They have a very large pool there in Pensacola, Florida. And so this day I'm going in there, marching in, fat, dumb, and happy, thinking everything's fine. You know, I'm in my PT gear. And we get there, we sit on this, we're in the pool, where I see this big contraption. I'm introduced to the helicopter dunker. And I'm listening to the brief that they're giving us what we're going to do. I got to go in that bad boy four times. And I'm listening. And then he goes two times, and we're going to get a number. And each time we go in it, there'll be like six to eight of us. I might be the pilot. Next time I might be the co-pilot. I might be somebody in the back. But we, so they drop the thing in the water. You put on your flight suit, your boots, your helmet, your gloves, all the stuff. You sit, you put on your seatbelt. They drop it. And a helicopter doesn't stay like that. When it gets full of water, it inverts. So we're going to be upside down. And you had to count to, I don't remember if it was six seconds or eight seconds, before you could undo your belt to get out. So, and they had divers down there. Uh, they had some fatalities over the years. Um, and I'm not sure when they instituted this because they had lost a lot of aviators in Vietnam because of helicopters crashing. So they made this device, I, I would imagine, in the 70s. And so they still, we still do this currently. And every four years, every four years, I had to go get retrained in this. Okay, so. First time I was in the back, and there's windows there, and they're not with, they don't, they're just holes where a window would be. So you can go right out it. So, and it, they got divers down there, I told you, and they're watching you, because if you unbuckle too fast, you fail. You had to do it again. And they only give you three chances. So if you tapped out three times, so <laughs> you hit the thing, now they rock it. They just don't just, you just don't know like, oh, I'm going this way so I can hold my breath longer. Sometimes they rock it. You'd get right to the water, and then they'd bring it back, and then they'd go the other way, and you'd go under, and you're just like, this is so much fun. You get under there, you count to the six or eight, you undo it, and you'd go out the quickest exit you could, all you, <coughs> you and all your friends. <coughs> now you're upside down. But when your eyes are open, it's pretty easy to see which way's up. Well, the second time we do it, blindfolded. How fun, because the reality is in the ocean, in the waters you go, you many times can't see. You might have crashed and you might have lost your eyesight. So we do the second one blindfolded. And again, when we do it, you can go out of any exit you want. Okay, the closest one. Third time, third time, we're not blindfolded. And we all have to work together to go out the main entrance. Some of us aren't very good at waiting. And so, but we had to work together, and we couldn't go out. The, we had to all go out. So, you know, third time, the fourth time, the fourth time, we all had to go out the same exit, but we were all blindfolded. So, I tell you that story, this personal experience, because 
And this should have, you know, maybe you don't have anything that extreme, because I did some kind of extreme things in my naval career, this being one of them. But um, I think you might have situations that you could apply this to. In fact, I know you all can. See, when I'm describing this at the time, my focus during this thing was on drowning. And I remember literally thinking, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill myself doing this. And I, then I started to go, my mind started to go, I mean, I'm sitting there in the stands listening to this guy going, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm going to kill myself. I'm going not going to make it. And what are they going to say about me back in Wisconsin? Like Adam died in this stupid little tin can, you know? I mean, this is what's going through my mind, okay? Right? But here's the point I want to bring out. My self-talk, my self-talk was all about what will people think if I fail? Now, the Word of God tells me that in this type of situation is to have faith and put on righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost because I'm an overcomer. Okay? Or in other words, my focus... I heard, you know, Aaron was up here talking about focus. See, my focus... His focus had to be in it. His focus should have been right then on driving, and he admitted it. My focus then should have gone from, you know, failing, you know, think I'm going to fail this, or drowning, or dying, to the exhilaration of the experience doing something I have never done before, because this was for my benefit if I wanted to stay in this program that I said yes to. Because this is going to save my life maybe someday. This is the truth, and many of us go, I don't want any part of that. Well, then God's going, well, then I can't give you what I got right around the corner. Folks, see... I had to change my self-talk to go, hey, this is for your benefit, dummy. Like, this will really benefit you down the road. Embrace this and enjoy it. We cannot focus people on what we're afraid of, but rather focus on the good thing that is about to happen. Like, don't focus on not going and apologizing to so-and-so, or don't focus on, well, I just can't go forgive that guy. No. The good thing that's going to happen is restoration, forgiveness. Right? And you've got to tell, just like in this, I had to tell myself this experience will give me a new definition of who I am. Okay? And see, if I break that down to transformation, it's all about, and see, I'm, I'm really, really serious about this. This isn't like a joke. This is serious. It's that our body must line up with what we're saying. If, in other words, if we're talking victory, then we better look like Is this, now are you tasting what I'm chewing? All right. See, what that really boils down to is you got to own and master your own body. Don't let it master you. Don't let your mind, no, renew your mind, right? And if you can't do that, if you're sitting there going, well, I, I just, mm, mm, you know, let me tell you what's going on. You're dealing with a stronghold. You are. You're dealing with a stronghold. There's a demon controlling your state and bringing you under the heel of its state. A spirit of depression will not let you change your physiology. So you know what you need to do? This is where you rise up. You take on that demon head up. You just hit it head on. You be like David and just run to that giant. Don't let yourself be taken captive anymore. Well, you know what you need to do? Bind it. Cast it out. That's what you need to do. See, Paul was talking about this when he's talking to young Pastor Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24, he's teaching him about how to interact with people. He says, hey... And a servant of the Lord, like you are, Timothy, must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance, so that they may know the truth, and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. So we were take, people would be taken captive. So folks, here's the deal. Don't you think it's way beyond time that we challenge each other to walk in the Spirit if we're really living in the Spirit? This is the deal. Like, we should be encouraging each other. When somebody comes down, you should go, wait, 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 come on, man. People are watching us all the time, right? And if you hit that obstinate state, recognize you may have hit a demon, and don't allow that demon spirit to dictate your condition. Don't allow yourself to be distracted because focus is crucial. 
focus literally means we have to moment to moment zero in on what God is showing us to look at. And, and here's another thing I found out. Most of us don't have control of our focus. All the demonic has to do is to get us off track is to distract us with some aspect of something that bugs us. Right? I, I know this has happened. I suspect, well, maybe today while you're listening to me, while I'm preaching, if there's something you don't agree with, you know, you're going, going arr, arr, that ain't right. Mm, tweak, you know, you're just tilting your head. What the shnikes is that all about? And that's staying with you. You're not even listening to the rest of this because you're still stuck on that thing back there. That's a, this concept of being take the, taken captive at will. So we got to remember this. Our focus will determine the meaning we attach to whatever is going on in our life. If we focus on the Word of God and the will of God, we will be invincible. If we focus huh, on planes flying into buildings, on terrorists, on hostages, every negative thing you're going to see on the news, you know what? It's very easy for you to be taken captive. Our focus will determine the direction we move on. We should be focusing on transformation, taking control, taking ownership of our body, taking ownership of renewing our mind, not blaming it on situations, not blaming it on people. Get rid of the past. Just get rid of that and move forward with today. Today's a new day, right? And our physiology, the way we carry our body, will determine whether we be in agreement with that so we're working our all cylinders are working on on faith okay and if our self-talk then is in an agreement with what we're believing if our talk just doesn't line up we're gonna blow it that's how easy it is see if if we really want our entire spirit soul and body sanctified then here's the deal we got to align our hearts. so that means we a heart gets circumcised we had a stony heart now it's a not a stony heart we receive Jesus your heart is circumcised and it we will respond to the spirit and focus on that and then our soul will get in a line with that by how godly self-talk victorious self-talk overcoming self-talk and then align the body to show that this is how you do it it's very practical we kind of discard the body no it's the best I mean people will say hey man people aren't supposed to judge me you know what? They're going to judge you by looking at what you're displaying. If you're, say, you're a Christian, they're going to go, if that's what a Christian is, I don't want it. You don't even have to open your mouth. That's a Christian? Whoa. And all you got to do if that's you is just go, wait a second, I need to repent. I need to pick myself back up. And if we see somebody like that, we help them. We go, come on, brother. Come on, sister. Mm. See, again, this is the stuff Candace and I talk about all the time. You know what this is like? This is like if you strike gold. You get a gold. I said it was like oil. It's like gold. It's just gold in a field. It just never runs out. It's just you come back there. Me and Candace have been talking about this since many of you know us. This is what we talk about all the time. Transforming. Getting in line. Understanding what happened to you when you received the Holy Spirit. You, you received the Holy Spirit. It's a free gift. You did it by grace. But grace, it comes. You have to believe by faith. But then... That's not the end of the story. That's the very beginning to get you on your transformation process. And it's done by renewing your mind. And, you know, and I can just look at someone and say, your physiology, your body is not lining up with what you've been telling me about what you believe. I mean, in other words, if you really believe what you've been telling me you believe, you would look a whole lot different. The moment your body gets in step with your spirit, watch how your soul will get in alignment. Just... Try this right now. Go ahead and smile. Just smile. Watch how hard it would be to get depressed. So you can't do it. You start laughing. You start giggling. You look at me and go, man, he's silly, but you're going to start laughing. You can't get depressed. Stand up straight. Put your shoulders back and walk like you have victory. And watch how hard it is to get intimidated by circumstances, death, or fear. Watch how people will treat you with more respect. Because you're commanding respect by the way you're carrying yourself. Huh. I'm going to ask the band to return. Now I'm going to end this today with something that I really believe will inspire us. It's from the book of Daniel. Because here's the deal. You kinda, if you're paying attention today, you're picking up on this. Who we really are is not determined by what you've already done. You might have done some great things, but that is not encapsulate you. You've got greater things coming. 
okay? Who we really are cannot be measured by what we've done because we've barely tapped into who we are in Christ. In other words, who we really are, who you really are, I don't think you know yet. Here's who we are. Daniel chapter 11, verse 32. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Strong and do exploits. The people that know their God will be strong and do great exploits. In other words, here's the deal. Christians, we are to go from victory to victory, strength to strength, while the world goes from crisis to crisis. That should be the difference, right? The people who know their God are going to be doing exploits, and the people who know their God are going to be people who have mastered their spirit, soul, and body. And this is something that we each have an opportunity to do. So as I started today saying, I mean, I needed to look at myself, and I wanted to share this, that we each have this issue. We each can receive from this. Right? There it is. If you want to do something with how you've been, you need to look in the mirror and go, wait, this issue, this person I'm looking at is the issue. And I can adjust this based on what I just heard today. It's in the Word of God. It doesn't take long to figure this out. And, it, and as quick as you want to do this, it's up to you. It can be done, snap of the fingers, blink of an eye. I mean, he's not going to relent. They're going to sing the song, he won't relent. He's not going to relent. He's still waiting for you to grab a hold of this because he's got so much for little old you to do. Yeah, little old you. That's the way I thought when I was going in that helo dunker. Like, there ain't no way. There ain't no way. Ended up being a commander in the Navy, commanding 1,700 people in a whole little city in Texas. I never thought a little boy from farmland in Wisconsin, and you got a similar story too. You can do this. You can do this, but you can't do it alone. You have to submit to the Lord. You have to submit to Jesus Christ. And how do you do that? You believe in him, you confess your sins, you believe in your heart, you confess with your mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, and he will never leave you. If you believe it and you confess it, and you believe that and it's done by grace through faith in him. Hallelujah. We partake in communion here every Sunday. It's in the back where the lamps are. Listen, if you've received Jesus Christ, we want you to do this. Why? Because Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. So we do this every Sunday as another form of worshiping him. It's a different than the singing and, and the praising or when we have dancing up here or listening to the message. This is another way to praise and worship him. And he says, do this in remembrance of me. And you partake of the elements. The, the bread symbolizes his body, which is done for healing. It heals us physically, emotionally, and then we partake of the fruit of the vine. And we do this for the forgiveness of sins. Remember the blood that was shed. He said, drink this. This is my blood. Eat my body. So that's what we do. The altar team will be up here. I encourage you to continue praising and worshiping our Lord and Savior, Jesus. To come to your feet.